Well, hello, my name is Bob Barker, Managing Partner at Barker Gilmore, and thank you for joining today's GC Advantage webinar. Uh, the topic today is balancing the roles of business partner and manager of legal risk. Uh, we have some upcoming webinars. Uh, the one that's going to be uh, most uh, coming up next, I should say, is uh, Women in Law, Discovering the True Meaning of Success. And that's going to be held on June 16th. Um, Michelle Banks, a senior advisor at Barker Gilmore, will be joined by three of her uh, co-authors of a book, Women in Law, Discovering the True Meaning of Success. And they'll discuss uh, diverse career journeys that they've made to achieving success in law and beyond, including getting promoted or published, um, starting a new job, or maybe it's a podcast, uh, as well as uh, becoming an entrepreneur and more. Uh, today's uh, presentation will be recorded and added to the library in about three weeks, and an email will be sent to everyone who's registered uh, just to let you know that uh, the material is available and, and you can reference that as well as share it with friends and colleagues. Um, as far as uh, any questions uh, they have today, uh, please submit them uh, using the, the Q&A uh, feature in the Zoom app. It's down at the bottom of the screen. And uh, you'll be able to review questions that have already been submitted. Um, if you like one that is already listed, then by giving a thumbs up, uh, then you will uh, notify the panelists that that's a very popular question and it'll uh, go to the, the top of the list. And we'll do our best to, to answer as many of these questions um, submitted uh, by the end of the session today. Um, at this point, I look to, uh, to hand this over to Helen Pudlin. And Helen, thanks for leading this uh, discussion today. And I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Bob, and thank all of you for joining us. And we really appreciate you sharing your time with us today. We have a great panel with us to share their insights and experiences regarding balancing the roles of manager of legal risk and business partner. Uh, Greg, before we get to the formal program, would you share your background? Yeah, hi, everybody. Uh, sure, Helen. I'm Greg Jordan. I'm the general counsel and chief administrative officer at PNC. I've been with the company, um, I'm in my ninth year or just heading into my ninth anniversary, I guess. Uh, before that, I spent 29 years in private practice, all with the law firm Reed Smith. Uh, was a litigator there for most of the time. And then the last 13 years or so was the chairman and managing partner. So I've seen both sides of uh, the law firm side and the in-house side. Thanks so much, Greg. And Mike, would you share your background? Good morning and good afternoon, everybody. My name is Mike Williams, and uh, I'm a senior advisor here at Barker Gilmore. I had 22 years in private practice in Los Angeles before going in-house as the general counsel of Sony Electronics. And from there, I was the uh, executive vice president, chief legal officer at Staples, and then uh, retired and joined Barker Gilmore. So great to be here today with you, Helen, and the rest of the team. Thanks from the West Coast. And could you share your background? Uh, thank you, Helen, and thank you for pulling this, this great group together. I'll be very interested in our conversation. Uh, I, prior to retirement, was the um, general counsel at the J.M. Smucker Company, and, and prior to that, also in private practice, M&A partner at a Midwest-based law firm. And then just before I retired, I had the privilege to begin serving on both public and private corporate boards. So I spend a good deal of my time since retirement serving on those corporate boards, in addition to having the privilege to work with Barker as a senior advisor and coach for some very talented general counsels. Um, and, it, and that perspective also really provides me the opportunity to see some of the topics we're going to be talking about today from both inside the boardroom, outside the boardroom as a GC, and then looking in as an advisor. So. Be an interesting conversation. Thanks so much, Anne. And uh, I was uh, formerly general counsel of PNC, preceding Greg with one general counsel between us. I currently also serve as a senior advisor at Barker Gilmore, along with Anne and Mike. 
and provide coaching and advisory, advisory services to general counsel and the legal teams. I also serve on for-profit and non, not-for-profit boards. I've been a lecturer at Penn Law School where I taught a course on challenges facing general counsel. And before joining PNC, I was a partner in the law firm of Alice Barr. So now turning to the program. Um, CEOs and other business leaders increasingly want their general counsel and inside lawyers to act as business partners, in addition to managers of legal risk. Greg, do you see a tension between those roles and what are your tips for balancing or choosing those roles? Yeah, I, I mean, there's always the potential for tension, but um, I think today uh, most GCs are, are you know, very much part of the C-suite. Um, of course, we're there principally keeping an eye on legal things um, and uh, legal risk in particular, providing legal advice and counsel. But we're also members of the C-suite. We're on equal footing with other business leaders who report directly to the CEO. Uh, that can involve talking about you know, how the heck to navigate the next round of COVID, and return to work, remote issues. Some of that has a legal edge to it. A lot of it doesn't. Uh, and, um, and I think that's really the way the GCs uh, are, are going to be functioning moving forward. Um, you know, the tension is, though, sometimes you have to tell the boss or your peers no because of a legal issue. And uh, as long as you're clear about um, wh when you're doing that, why you're doing it, and that that's got to be the answer, um, I think you can navigate, you know, being an executive member of the team and also uh, the general counsel giving legal advice when you need to. So, um, you know, having good relationships with, uh, with your colleagues in the C-suite uh, is important. And I know all the folks on this call, um, you know, succeeded in large part because we were able to do that. So I think I'll leave it there, Helen. I am getting a, uh, one of those WebEx announcements saying my computer is going to shut down in 17 minutes. So if it does, I'll I'll dial right back right back in. I don't I don't know how to get it to quit ticking here. Uh, Mike, how was your legal department structured to help fuse the roles, uh, and how were your lawyers integrated into the business? Sure, Helen. Well, I assigned the lawyers as the principal point of contact for each business unit. So I wanted the business unit to think or actually have a, their own lawyer, like his or her lawyer for that business unit. And if possible, I had the lawyer physically located within that BU, I mean, on the floor in the same area of the building, because um, proximity does count for things when you pick up information and hear things, people are more likely to consult with you. Um, I also had a rule for my business unit lawyers that if there was a conflict between a business unit meeting, like a business review, something that was important for the lawyer to attend versus a law department meeting, the business unit meeting took precedence. The BU, the lawyer could always send a deputy to learn how to delegate, but that's what I want to send the message that business, the business was first and foremost in everyone's mind. Specialists like HR litigation, they were separate. Um, and in, in structuring the department, I always look to think about like structuring it like uh, the oil and gas companies. You have an upstream side and a downstream side. So in retail and manufacturing, you're acquiring goods, and then you're turning around and selling them. And that's how we sort of structured it the same way, put the lawyers in those different streams. Thanks, Mike. Uh, Greg, do you have the lawyers actually sitting on the business floors um, or not? And do you see an advantage or disadvantage in one or the other? Yeah, I like what Mike said. You know, we have lawyers scattered around PNC these days in different cities. So it's, you know, they're, they're, they are kind of out in the field in, in Pittsburgh, where our headquarters is, where most of our executives and our lawyers are. Um, we have a bit of both. We have a couple of floors that are all lawyers. And then we have um, other folks uh, who are embedded in with their business, like the the general counsel for the corporate bank sits with the corporate bank, the uh, uh, HR lawyers sit with the HR team, uh, the IP lawyers sit with uh, some of the innovation team. Um, I like that. I think uh, Mike's right, you know, having people right there with the clients uh, reinforces that uh, the lawyers are part of the team and 
you shouldn't only go to them at, at the last minute if something's going wrong, but have them have them at the table. And as you know, Helen, that's kind of the model that that you had at PNC, where the lawyers are out and embedded in the business, whether wherever they sit, they're part of the meetings all throughout a project, not just at the last minute. And I think that's 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 been the right model, and we're sticking with it. And what was the model you had? Um, yeah, it, it's. Um, I think that both Greg and, and Mike are absolutely right that in a perfect world, it's terrific to have lawyers embedded in the business units. For some companies that just don't have that scale, maybe on a growth trajectory, but just don't have that scale, it can be difficult. So you do find yourself, you know, if you have six or seven lawyers or even a dozen lawyers that someone will, will handle the commercial issues, someone will handle the HR issues. So in a perfect world, it's great to have them embedded, but if they're more service line structured, um, which is what we were at least in the beginning at Smucker, largely due to that scale, um, then it's really incumbent upon those lawyers to spend that time um, with their business colleagues, either just on the phone and really being intentional about checking in or, um, you know, however you need to manage that, you just need to step back and be very intentional about how you do create those relationships. Because it, it, in my experience, it, hit, it really is only when you're seen as a business partner that you can start to have that impact. So. Right. I think I, I lived in both environments. One company, I had them embedded. The other company, when I arrived, they were all in this, you know, one floor, one area. So, and I couldn't physically move people. So I made sure that people were going out and spending as much time out of their office, walking the floors or being with the business units, going to their business meetings, going to the sales conferences and all that stuff to feel as much as they could part of the team, yeah. you know, and that probably works for a smaller organization where in a big one, you have the luxury of moving people around the building. Yeah. When, when we moved to a kind of an integrated model, um, the uh, business people and functional leaders were not used to having lawyers at their management meetings and risk meetings. And there was initially some resistance and um, I persuaded them that it would be better for them in terms of uh, identifying risk early and managing risk early. And I assured them that the lawyers wouldn't interfere with having a, a free flow of business discussion. <laughs> and it turned out uh, that after a really short amount of time, they really appreciated having the lawyers at their meetings. And the lawyers got a lot out of it too because they got a broadened perspective and it helped them develop relationships. Um, Mike, what are the potential consequences of see, being seen only as a legal risk manager and not also as a business partner? Well, I think you just alluded to it a little bit, Helen, where the, you're going to have limited involvement or your lawyers will have limited involvement and limited knowledge of what's going on in the business unit. And it's very dangerous for us to think that business people are capable of or even uh, good at or experts at identifying legal risks. Some business people I've worked with, they're very good at business, but a legal risk could come up and bite them from behind and they wouldn't know it until they got bit. So having the lawyer there, you can convince them saying, look, it, we're not to be the naysayers and to be the wet blanket in the par on the party, but you know, let us learn. And as we go along, we can identify risks. We had an example where I had the person in the unit and they want to expand SKUs for first aid kits. We buy them from established manufacturers, no problem. Now the business wants to do it on their own, private label. Well, if you're going to do private label and bring them into this country, you're now the importer of record of a medical device, which requires FDA approval. They never saw that legal risk. And they were about to go off and start doing deals to bring first aid kits in without having the appropriate authorization. But because the business people were there, or excuse me, the lawyer was in the meeting early, they could identify that as a risk that needs to be addressed and save a lot of heartache down the line. Very yeah. Good. yeah. And, and Helen, if I may, you know, I think Mike raises a, a great point, and that is 
the notion of the difference between business risk and legal risk is not always clear. In fact, it's it's very gray. And it goes back to that tension that Greg started us off with about, you know, how, how do you not become um, the, the naysayer? How do, how do you manage that tension between being a business partner and also being a good legal advisor? I think that it, it's all wrapped up together. If you're in the room from the start, um, it, you can really mitigate that risk. And to be mindful that business risks have legal components and legal risks have have business components. And it's almost foundational about, for me, the foundation of what we're talking about today is that to be in the room and to be able to say no when it's absolutely necessary all stems from the relationship you have with your colleagues in the C-suite, with the CEO, with the CFO, those tend to be the two touch points that uh, um, raise issues in, in a urgent way. Um, and, and so it'll be interesting to have the conversation about how you develop that credibility. It's also important to obviously understand the business, uh, to have credibility, and right. also assess the risk. So both legal and business risk. Um, Greg, how have you gone about helping business leaders achieve their objectives if you've had significant concerns about the legal risks or the reputation risks or the ethics of their proposed actions? Have you suggested alternatives? Have you given recommendations? What's your philosophy? Yeah, I mean, what what we've tried to do in PNC Legal is be very uh, very much a direct uh, advisor and and, uh, uh, open, transparent partner talking with the business leaders about our view of whatever it is they're considering. And if it's a it's pretty clear it's a hard fly, hard, hard no, you know, no fly zone. You can't do what you're talking about. We want to be very clear about that. If it's something that's not necessarily illegal, but we think it creates risk that could be avoided if you tweak it a little bit, um, we, we will um, give them those options. And, and where we feel like uh, we've got a pretty good view, we'll make a recommendation. You know, we also recognize, you know, at certain times there are various ways to do something and there is a business decision to be made and that may be made by them and not us. So we try to understand, you know, which, which sort of which flavor of, of thing do we have? Do we have a hard fly, hard, hard no fly zone on a legal issue? Do we have something that uh, we feel pretty strongly this would be the best option and why with regulators or reputational risk? Or is it just something where there are various ways to do it and we'll present them and say, you guys, you're closer to it than we are. You decide any of these are fine with us. So we have all those kinds, Helen. And I think, you know, having that close counsel relationship, not just me with C-suite, but with my team, with their business partners uh, allows you, I think, to do that well. Great, yeah. Do you, do you provide recommendations in addition to giving options and uh, probably calibrating the risk along the continuum of options? I'm, oh, is that for me, Helen? I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yes, I do. I mean, going back to Greg and Ann's point and yours earlier, it's like, if I look at starting up not to tension between the role of business advisor and legal advisor, but one of competency. Are, are we in a highly regulated industry that I know something about, like in banking or finance, which I know nothing about? Or are we in tech or retail? And, you know, and are we in the wild west of tech where you might be the only adult in the room? So, and you can get credibility with the C-suite by, you know, sp- spending time learning the business. Do you walk, do you work the retail floor if you're in a retailer? Do you go to the warehouses? Do you see how FCs or dis- distribution centers are run? Do you ride along with a truck driver when they make a delivery to understand what route driving is for an office supply company? All these things you can do as a lawyer, it's not gonna kill you, but you start learning credibility that you're trying to learn and understand their business as not only doing your technical work as a lawyer. So I think it depends a little bit on how much you know about that industry, about the company. When I was new to the office supply business, I knew all about consumer electronics. I knew nothing about ink, paper, or toner, or the printing business. So I you know, listened, learned, 
Uh, and then when I felt more comfortable, could opine on certain areas that, you know, why are we doing this? Does that make business sense, et cetera, et cetera. So that's how I'd approach, uh, you know, to gain the street cred, if you would, with the business people, then uh, they see that you're generally interested in their problems. Thanks. And did you give recommendations or just lay out options or depend or depends on well, it, your audience? It, yeah, it, everything's situational, right? Every, everything's situational. It depends on both the facts of, of what you're being asked to provide options for, and it depends on, on um, who's doing the asking and, and what situation um, that creates. But by and large, the answer is yes. And certainly, um, sort of the more time in the, in the role, um, it became expected. You know, not to say that they always um, took my recommendation, but certainly they were eager and open to hearing it so long as it was supported by you know, a rationale and thought process that, that really tried to further that business objective. But yeah, absolutely. But it does matter on who's doing the asking and, and what the facts are. <laughs> yeah, it can also, I think sometimes the lawyers, I mean, you don't have to go to business school to have a smart or correct answer, you know, just like we had one marketing person who wanted to use uh, the logos in um, names of Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL. You didn't have, we didn't have a license to use those logos or names in advertising, but they were saying, well, they use them to broadcast in high definition. They should watch our you know, the games on our TVs in high definition. There's a connection between Sony cameras and Sony TVs. And I said, well, rather than violate trademark law, why don't we just say, you know, if all major league sports sh shoot their games in high definition, doesn't it make sense to watch it in a Sony high definition television? We can allude to, we came up with that answer and they said, oh yeah, that's great. So they made us honorary marketeers. So. <laughs> Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that's, you know, sort of the great value of a, of a good general counsel and having a good relationship with business people. I mean, your business judgment is, um, is quite critical and is often as good as the business judgment of anybody else in the room. So, um, Mike, just uh, sticking with you for a minute, yeah. is, uh, are there times when uh, you've just had to say no and under what? What circumstances? I'm going to ask you a multi-part question. <laughs> yeah. Uh, are there uh, any appropriate um, areas of compromise for the GC and inside lawyers when it comes to following the law? And is it ever appropriate to engage in a cost-benefit analysis in deciding or recommending whether to follow the law? So if you remember any of those questions. <laughs> <laughs> this, is like a, this is like a bar exam? Come on. <laughs> OK. No, but I, I like to think myself as a positive person in that we're not running the department of no, right? But I also learned that if you want people to like you and you want to make people happy, then join the circus and become a clown. But we have a job to do and we have a purpose to fulfill at our companies. Our job, okay, give timely legal advice and guidance to the business unit so it can accomplish its business objective. But we, the lawyers, share the same purpose as a business and that is our job is to build a sustainable business for the future. And when the lawyers and the business people are aligned on that purpose, because everyone has a different job, when we all have the same common purpose, then it makes giving the advice and getting to the right answer uh, easier. Now, in terms of something close to the line or going over the line, I mean, I think the rules of professional conduct frown on us advising people to break the law, plain and simple. Um, there are gray areas and particularly in litigation, advocacy, executive orders come out, you know, you can look at it in a good faith basis saying, wait a second, this doesn't smell right. I think it should be changed. We have a legitimate basis to challenge it. Let's do that. But at the end of the day, it's sometimes just basic, you know, you were, what you were taught in kindergarten, what Anna and I talked about earlier uh, before the seminar is just like, you have a moral compass, you know, what's right, you know, what's wrong. And many times, business people in the rush to make the quarter, to make the number, to do the deal, they lose sight of that fact. And it's sometimes our, our job is, you know, the adult in the room to bring back that perspective, say, guys, no sale is worth jail. I mean, forget it. 
Dan, uh, if you have a, a different perspective on this. Well, uh, I, I, my, it, it, I've not yet disagreed with Mike. Perhaps it's coming someday, but I think he's he's spot on. But to take it one step further, again, it's uh, what we do and where we create value is helping navigate those nuanced situations. And those nuanced situations arise every single day. Um, it would be nice if it was all black and white, but it could be a question of, um, contract enforcement. You know, if if we are thinking for what may be good and valid reasons that we just can't adhere to the terms of a contract, that is a, in my view, that is a different conversation with the business unit versus violating um, a very clear cut F, FPCA, FCPA, you know, rule. Um, so I think you know it is it is nuanced. Um, there are cost benefit analysis to be done in the contract situation. At the end of the day, the moral compass and the culture of the company needs to be firmly grounded and we need to, to keep that in front of us to, to reach the right result. But, but there is often, not always, a continuum. And when, there's, when it is black and white, if you've developed that relationship, and, and you've been able to find creative solutions in other situations, they will listen when you say, this is just one of those times we cannot do this. Also, if you're not somebody and your legal department is not a department where you're always saying the sky is exactly. um, right. If it's right. always a no, or always this is gonna be a disaster, you have less credibility to, um, have influence in the things that are really significant. Right. right, no one leaves the theater then because it's not really burning. <laughs> yeah. And right. also when you talk about cost benefit analysis, Helen, you can you try to go back, I try to use examples of prior companies that have made stupid decisions or maybe not the greatest thing. And you may recall, remember back in the days of Skechra and Reebok, the toning uh, sneakers that would firm your buttocks and make your calf muscles 20% stronger or better. I'm still wearing those. Is there something wrong with them? <laughs> that, bit, that market went from $17 million in 2008 to over a billion in basically 2010. Reebok was sued along with several other manufacturers for false claims because they couldn't substantiate the health benefits these sneakers allegedly made. Well, at the end of the day, they wound up paying $25 million in a settlement for a fine. Now, was it worth the cost in terms of the sales and how much profit they made over selling sneakers over that four or five year period? Who knows? But I point to the business people, look at the harm you've done to your brand and the reputation. How many consumers are not going to buy from you in the future because they don't trust you? That's something that's insurmountable, incalculable, which a business lawyer would point out to the business people if they're about to do this, hey, let's do it wait till we get caught, then we'll stop. Yeah. You know, but that is a great illustration of how to influence um, by raising questions of potential consequences. And the people get it if you raise those questions, especially consequences they hadn't thought through, right? I mean, yeah, and I think particularly, Ellen, when, when, you're, when you have such good examples and they keep being put in front of us every day and, uh, you know, we all can think, geez, I'm glad I'm not the GC or the CEO of that company. Uh, and the, you know, the reputational risk uh, outcomes are mostly they're what much worse than the legal outcome of losing a case or, or uh, you know, s some fine or something. Uh, the reputational risk uh, for some of the big banks and others in the other industries, you know, has been severe and. Uh, uh, one scandal or another uh, causing it, or today, some of the political missteps that we're all tempted to make uh, in, in big companies uh, where we, uh, you know, get lulled into commenting on things that may not be our business and, uh, and you end up, um, you know, getting whacked, uh, usually from both sides. So nobody's happy with what you say. So, so I think the reputational risk management uh, is right alongside the legal risk management. And the GC has a key role to play in helping give good practical advice about what could happen uh, if we uh, lose our way. Yeah, absolutely. And to, to Greg's really good 
Good point. Nothing will appear above the fold faster than a reputational story. Yeah. Um, it's it um, it's lightning. Yeah. This question because this just starts something. Um, I'll start with you, Greg, and then and Mike. Jump in on whatever you're going to say too. But um, how often do you use what's happened to others as a teachable moment for the leadership team, for the lawyers? Um, yeah, it seems like every day, it's certainly every week, you know, because we all have the clips files that come around and there's always something in there that makes you think, geez, that could be us if we aren't paying attention. Uh, it might be another bank, but oftentimes it's just another big company that has employees or has people misbehaving or, you know, um, you know, doing one thing or another that we just shouldn't be doing. So it is easier to um, get people's attention when you're talking about a real company and a real story that everybody has read online that day. And uh, it just makes it all more real. So, you know, the information overload these days is pretty painful. But in this sense, um, knowing everybody's seeing this stuff in real time, I think helps us get their attention. Right, Mike, I cut you off. Oh, no, no, I was just going to say to Ann and Greg's point, and I think to every lawyer listening in, is that Yes, we do give the timely legal advice and guidance to the business unit, but the more important function that Greg talked about and ended was that reputational protection, the brand. That to me, as an in-house lawyer, I emphasize that we are guardians of the brand. That, you know, I worked at two companies where the brand was everything. It was a global brand. And at the end of the day, I have to remind business people sometimes that the brand, it's not something that's in a box or on the closet. It's, it's a promise. It's a promise of performance, of reliability, of credibility, of integrity. But it's that, just a promise. And customers trust our brand. And if we're going to do something stupid, whether it's legal or not, but if it's stupid, that's going to harm the brand. And no executive, no matter who or she is in the company, has the authority to damage or destroy or hurt the brand. The brand belongs to the shareholders, not the sales department, not the marketing department. And I have to remind sometimes that, you know, trust leaves on a horse and returns by foot. And usually when you bring that home to the business people, when it's a questionable issue and they think through the reputational risk, the harm, the damage it could cause to the brand, then usually they get to the right decision. Mm -hmm. uh, and, th and that's the case in any business. I mean, yeah. and in the consumer products business, um, your brand was critical. Yes. Yeah. You know, and one of the questions we all often get, Helen, is as we have these conversations among our, amongst ourselves is, well, how do you develop that credibility with the CEO, the CFO, or other members of the C-suite? And, and it's a multifaceted answer, and, and it, the first answer is probably over time, but what Mike just said is really critical to developing that relationship and that respect, and that is for the executive to see you actively thinking about issues other than straight legal issues and to voicing them in a way that is focused on supporting the success of the company, whether it's a strategic initiative or the value of the brand, whatever it is, that, that's a critical component of building that credibility. Mm -hmm. uh, Greg, were you about to? I just I just got a note that they want me to go to the court. So uh, I'm, <laughs> you okay. guys know what I mean. So I'm going to sign off here. But uh, the judge says I'm supposed to be there. I've got to go there. So okay. that, I'm sorry okay. I have to cut out, but I've enjoyed it. But you've got uh, you've got the pros with you. Uh, no, don't worry, Greg. Um, We've got your bail covered. OK, <laughs> <laughs> thanks. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much, Greg. Good luck. <laughs> Good luck. Uh, Mike, what are what are the added complications when representing a multinational company and when the laws of practice laws and practices vary in different different well, countries and jurisdictions? That I mean, in terms of certain business practices um, which are illegal or criminalized in the United States, many of those same practices, while they may be civilly wrong or frowned upon in different jurisdictions. They're not criminal. So you're dealing with executives, let's say in Europe or in Asia, who realize, okay, price fixing, if we get caught, we have to pay a fine to the EC. 
and move on in life. Where in the United States, you can talk to an executive saying, you realize if you're caught price fixing, you could go to jail. I mean, and given the example of the air cargo, 22 of those air cargo executives of different airlines all did federal time and paid fines because they were caught. Some were even extradited back to the United States uh, to face sentencing. So you have to understand the culture and the nature in order to make your point, you know, when you're talking or counseling, because the person may be listening to you, but they're thinking, I don't have to worry about it. The company's going to take care of me. They'll pay my salary while I'm doing time. They'll take care of my family. Um, so what, you know, what's the big deal? Why not price fix it? Like, that's, it's not that simple as black and white. And that's where you have to go into the more the reputational or brand risk is because no matter what nationality or culture you're dealing with, if the company is paramount and they're going to do anything to protect the company, that includes the brand. Right. But I mean, you do yeah. have to be sensitive to it. Uh, look at the examples of so many companies where it took years and years to recover from uh, their reputation risks and brand risks. I mean, there were huge legal fines. Uh, oh, yeah. But in addition, um, as significant was years to recover. And then other companies started taking their market share. Right. Or you think of times where, um, you know, employ a, a factor manufacturing overseas where you try to audit the supply chain, know what's going on. But remember one company got caught using child labor to make sneakers. I can, we still remember that brand. Uh, it's a, it's a long time, you know, thing. Um, it's, 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 it's real. And sometimes you have to remind people of that. And I used to keep a list of all these, like the greatest hits <laughs> to remind business people, you know, like this is real and it has consequences. And another great value the lawyers have to have to add, uh, in addition to assessing you know, what what the loss is, and um, is asking what and, and raising questions about reputation and brand risk is what's and Greg alluded to this. What's the political climate now? What's the regulatory climate? If you're in a regulated industry, how are the regulators going to feel about this, mm. and how are they going to feel about us? And what's it going to lead to if they are, uh, if we don't have credibility? And what's the political environment? Are we going to have the CEO called to Congress to testify? And what's happening to other countries? So all the companies, so those, all these questions that lawyers could add great value to as business partners and as, and as legal risk managers. I mean, you, you, you're not going to have a great business to run if you don't try to manage all these other risks. Right. And I sometimes at, at my prior company uh, at Sony uh, to educate the business people about risks and not to scare them, but I, you know, they say, how many federal or government agencies do you think we have to deal with or be wary of when we bring in one electronic product? They would have to say may, one or two, maybe. And it was actually 17 federal agencies touched or regulated our products in some means or manner. And the business people had no clue as to what that was all about. Yeah, I said, you do have to worry about the Department of Homeland Security if you're bringing in cargo from China, okay? And you do have to do a manifest of, you know, 48 hours before it's loaded on the ship, et cetera, et cetera. Had no idea, you know? <laughs> so knowing the environment, like you said, the regulatory environment, even in those industries, Helen, where people don't think you're regulated, you really are. And that helps build your credibility with the business people. So when you give an opinion about that might be difficult to do, they may, they're going to think, okay, well, he's speaking with some competency, you hope. Right. And it's almost about how we use language with our business partners, how we shift the conversation. Because what Mike just described is a great example of what might have been a, a good idea with many unintended consequences. Making a change in one particular product all of a sudden triggers 14 agencies that are going to need to touch and bless um, the, the change that we've just proposed. And so just helping them think through not the legal requirements, but the unintended consequences, which, oh, by the way, are legal requirements. But it just, it's, um, I'm constantly intrigued by how some people view 
legal requirements as something that causes them to just almost shut down the learning process when really there's a great opportunity to just have a conversation about um, just steps along the way. If we really want to go this direction, this is it's likely to take a year. And the reason it's likely to take a year is here are the steps along the way. You know, it's just so it's, part of it is how we approach that conversation as well. Mm -hmm. So um how have you, Anne, and how have you, Mike, um, guarded against lawyers what, what, what some call going native and favoring their business partner role at the expense of managing legal risks? Yeah, it's, um, it, it, I can only think of several occasions where I've actually had to, to manage that situation. And it really is, it's incumbent upon a GC to make sure that we're in touch on a regular basis with our team and that although we're not micromanaging, and here's, here's another kind of tension, not micromanaging what they're doing, that we're still in touch enough so we know when there's a little bit of a, um, um, a propensity to go rogue, if you will. And, and then to just, you know, it's that honest conversation of, you know, thank you for being such a great business advocate. But at the end of the day, our first and foremost responsibility is to do the right thing for the company. And we are the lawyer in this role. So it's it's about being close enough to, to see the issue and then just having that very prompt and difficult conversation of thanks for being a business person, but here we're walking the line. And help me understand what caused you to take this action. Because this isn't normally consistent with how we approach things in the legal department. So I just want to understand it. You know, kind of that that questioning mode. At least that's been my style, and it's been helpful for me in the past. Right. What I, what I also did uh, was rotation, uh, mm -hmm. rotating lawyers out of the business unit so no one gets too comfortable too long. Just like in the military, you go overseas, your tour of duty is 13, 15 months in the Far East, then I come back to the States. That's you, do, you didn't want people to get just so and you know, so set in their ways. So rotation. As Ann talked about communication, being part of the team, being part of, you know, law department team meetings, but also reporting structure and compensation. Because if I've got the handle on the salary and the bonus, then in the reporting th up through the chain of command to my department, that's an important factor in avoiding people out in the hinterlands going native or going rogue on you. Uh, because you do want to have that independent separate chain to ensure there is no divided loyalty. It's the company and the company is our client. And I have to keep reminding people sometimes that business executive is not your client. He or she is not the client, it's the company. And that, you know, you have to, I even have to remind myself now and then uh, when I was a GC, yeah. but that's something that we, you know, and, and especially younger lawyers in our mentoring leadership role to gently remind them of that fact, like, yes, it's great. They love you as a business person. You're a zealous advocate for your client. But let's look at the big picture here and then talk it through. Yeah. That, that comp point and reporting structure is really critical. In fact, sometimes we take it for granted. Um, but there have been situations when um, you need to have a conversation with the business person in that unit uh, just to make sure that, that you are clear about ultimately what that reporting structure is and who does drive those comp discussions. That's a really that really important component. Yeah. There's always that dotted line and that's what we support and that's what we want, but, but the hard line goes yeah. back to the GC. Right, uh, the only other additional suggestions I have is uh, for the lawyers to understand that you have their backs as the general counsel or as a senior leader in the legal department. And um, if they when they raise their hand, uh, even if it's unpopular, you will have their back if uh, you agree with the legal advice or business legal advice and their judgment. Um, and then I think it's also important to keep emphasizing the culture of compliance and integrity and ethics in the legal department in the company and at the end of the day you know as uh, Mike has said uh, you have your license and you have your 
legal license and you have your ethics and the business people aren't going to go down with you. Uh, you'll go down. And it's, we are all about an ethical, uh, doing the right thing, complying with the law legal department. So if you raise your hand, I will have your back and uh, you won't have to worry. So I think those are very important messages. And the corollary is the importance of escalation. That if they're concerned about something or the, about legality, ethics, even business calls, uh, you have an open door, you wanna hear about it. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. Um, Mike, we've had a few questions that, um, from our audience about uh, what safeguards are there to consider when crossing over from giving legal advice to business advice. And the related questions are, uh, you know, how do you uh, deal with the sort of privilege issue when you're moving over to giving legal advice or whether it's hybrid in a business meeting? Uh, do you, um, I guess, just how do you do it? Well, <laughs> uh, for starters, I, I'm always assuming that if I'm opining on a business issue, a pure business issue, giving my thoughts or questioning, like, why would we want to do business with that customer? Or why would we want to provide third-party logistic support to that competitor in that region of the country? Uh, you know, they find out the business rationale. I'm assuming that it's not going to be a privileged conversation. I, I just right off the bat, if it's something to do with that, they want my opinion about the business side. On the legal side, you know, Mike, is it legal for us to, you know, uh, carry this competitor's product on our website, right? Or whatever. Um, or is it legal for us to insist on resale price maintenance for this uh, digital still camera, right? That was quick. So, when we give that advice, I make it clear that in the email or the memo that it's, you know, attorney client privilege, all that stuff, rigmarole, but you, you, you're you sticking to the legal analysis of resale price maintenance and any exceptions under the Colgate doctrine, blah, blah, blah. And then you can go through it. Separate and apart from that would be my discussion about like, do you think it's worthwhile to have a resale price maintenance program for this product in this channel, right? Doesn't that create channel conflict among our different dealers or channels, right? Uh, do you have the guts, Mr. Business Person, that if the customer violates the program, you will cut them off. You will stop shipping those 20,000 units of cameras they've ordered that are worth a lot in sales because under our program, if there's a violation, there are no second chances, you're out. Uh, the, the, that business discussion is going to be separate and apart from anything I put in a legal memo or an email about the legality of it. And I do try to distinguish between the two, at least in writing. In a business meeting, it's more difficult uh, that, you know, you're not going to say, okay, now guys, I'm going to put on my legal hat and then I'm going to put on my business hat. You know, that doesn't happen in real world. Right. And you have any other, you know, just that the, in a business meeting context, it is tricky. I mean, I think that the most you can do is to be very clear. My, my business opinion is now shifting to a little bit as to what our legal risks are. You know, and, I, and even in a meeting, I would say, you know, this part of our conversation, it should remain privileged again. <laughs> it's not bulletproof. I'm not at all suggesting it is, but to bifurcate it as much as possible. And then obviously if, if you're committing something to writing, um, then then it's different. You have more control over it and, and you can choose your words right. in a different in a different way. But it is um, there aren't that many situations, at least in the businesses where I've supported, it certainly comes up, but it, it doesn't come up in every it doesn't come up every day. It's just in those situations where we, we're anticipating conflict or we know that we're potentially running close to the line um, that that it really becomes tricky. Right. And I had a, a real world example where it came up in an executive committee meeting where why can't we say a free sh next day shipping, shipping next day or free next day shipping? You know, Mike, why can't we say that? You know, marketing wants to say it. Legal says you can't. So right there, you put on the spot and say, well, 
what is exactly you want to say? Free day shipping, next day shipping, because that's not delivery. Are you saying that you want to say you're doing next day delivery? That's a different word, a different meaning. So what are we business wise? What do you want to say? And then they said, oh, well, it's next day delivery. Oh, well, that's a horse of a different color. Now, let me find out why the le your lawyer assigned to marketing opine that you cannot say next day delivery. And let me get back to you. So I was I wanted to buy some time. First of all, I didn't want to disagree with my subordinates in front of the executive team without understanding what the full rationale was. And then gave me time to I could parse through the legal issue of what claim you can make about delivery versus shipping. Then the legal then the business issue is if you say you deliver next day, how often do you really do it? How many SKUs are we talking about? What's your fulfillment rate? Because if your fulfillment rate's less than 90%, don't even go there. It's not worth it. So those that's where I used it to buy a little time, but I did separate out to make sure we're talking about the business, why you want to say it versus legally, can you say it? You know, one, one other thing, and then we have some great questions I want to make sure we get to um, before two o'clock. Uh, Another thing that I've done is if something is really, really sensitive and um, and incredibly potentially significant, uh, legally significant, I will call an outside lawyer in to participate in the meeting, mm -hmm. <laughs> so that I uh, may and and the lawyer provides legal advice and helps helps assure that uh, the conversation will be privileged. Mm -hmm. So um, let me turn to some of the questions and uh, some of which uh, you've all answered in the course of this discussion, but I think there's an interest, um, Anne, and it's, you've, you've raised it a few times and, and both of you and, and any other um, advice on how you develop personal credibility with the C-suite to get to the table and be in the room where the decisions are being made or discussed? Yeah, yeah, no, it, it's a great question. And um, it, to a certain extent, it's industry specific, I think. They, but if, so, for example, in a consumer products company, it's probably a little different than it is in a startup recently IPO tech company. But certainly to be a subject matter expert um, is, is sort of table stakes, sort of foundational. So you, you've got to learn the business. You've got to know the business. You know, show an interest in learning about the business and you need to come to that conversation as a seasoned and experienced lawyer with some experience in the area um, that the company in the space the company operates in. And you know Greg is a great example of coming to PNC with incredible experience and credibility and respect, having run a major law firm. He had experience, as a, a successful and talented lawyer, as a litigator, and that was a profile that was very attractive to PNC, but he'd also run a business, he'd run a law firm. So he came to the role with that kind of credibility. Developing it while you're in the role, is it's, it's all about relationship building. And ask yourself, um, who is my CEO? Who is my CFO? How, how do they manage? How do they operate? How can I bring value to them? So it's both industry specific and having the, the good EQ and, and people sense to step back and say, who, who are these individuals that I want to develop the relationship with? And what's the best way to do that? And then over time, um, it's, it, it's, it's working that plan. <laughs> and developing a, a real style and a leadership style that um, makes you a valued participant in the room. Right. There are two questions that I'm gonna combine because uh, they're related. And uh, uh, how do you develop uh, your team? How do you help your team calibrate risk sensors and understand what's an acceptable level of risk? What's truly a no-fly zone? And how do you ensure that their moral compass is aligned with yours and the C-suites? And a related question is uh, for some concrete examples of building good reputation, uh, you know, a good reputation for the legal department and the type of quarterly presentations that they could present in business meetings and sharing wins and even questions of risk. Hmm. Well, there's a, lot, there's a lot. There's a lot there to unpack. I, I mean, I going back to Anne's point about building credibility and studying, 
Okay. I mean, you learn the business. I, the first day, first week on the job at Staples, I spent extensive amount of time in the one-on-one -on -one meetings, interviews, get to know with the CFO, CMO, presidents of the commercial division, president of retail, meet the zone vice presidents, understand their business, go to the FCs and the DCs to understand how do they actually, how do you ship paper? How do these trucks operate, right? How do you sell products? What's back to school? Talk to the merchants, learn their business, all that stuff that you can learn. And then read the trade publications. There are retail trade, trade and join trade associations and go to their meetings. I'm not talking about the ACC, which is a fine organization. And I was a member of the board of directors of MCCA, but the retail industry leaders association was a trade association about retail. And you meet your colleagues in the retail where you have shared experiences and you can learn more about the latest techniques. And that brings, I think, more credibility to you and your role as the general counsel or business lawyer advisor uh, for that, you know. Thanks. And I forgot the uh, second part of the question. Sorry, Helen. <laughs> there, there were there were lots of lots of uh, subparts, but one subpart is, um, you know, how do you how do you help the team calibrate risk sensors and understand what's an acceptable level yeah. of risk, um, what's a no fly zone, and and how your how you make sure your compass and the C-suites um, risk appetite, moral compass is aligned with members of the legal department of right. Well, I'd say for me, it's lead by example. No one is gonna take more risk than the GC in the legal department. They're just not gonna get out ahead of you. So you've got to set the example. And I think and by your leadership, by your thinking, by your talking, working with your team to expand and share your moral compass of how you view the world. But more importantly, on the first day of my job, you know, I know everyone on the team wants to know, when do I need to talk to the GC? When do I need to advise him or her about what I'm doing? My rule of thumb was very simple. If the consequences of your decision or your advice could result in the personal injury or death of somebody, then I expect to be advised and consulted. Otherwise, I expect you to do your job and I'll support you, you know, because I'm not a micromanager. And that's sort of like where I start off. So if you're not going to kill somebody and not going to damage the brand, you know, I trust you to do your job. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I would agree with Mike that that's always the, the starting place. And when you see that um, you may not be sustaining that, you know, what, what, occasionally somebody does get out ahead of you or, or they repeatedly make calls that just don't make sense. I mean, that that's really a point in time where where it's important to step in and just say what what's going on here. But back to the um, and I know we need to, to wrap up, but back to the original question on um, tone at the top. You know, it, yeah. it, candidly, I was extraordinarily lucky and had the good fortune of working for a CEO and working with an executive team that walked their talk. Um, in everything they did. And, and so it really made a huge difference and on many levels made my job that much easier because everybody knew the moral direction of the compass was set by the CEO and it was adopted and embraced by every single person on the leadership team. And there, th that, that was there, no room for error. This is, this is who we are and this is how we do what we do. Um, but that tone at the top and leading by example is really is really critical. Yep. So uh, one, one final question, which I'll kind of really address in a half a minute is, uh, how do you integrate lawyers in the businesses if you're working remotely? I see, <laughs> I think, oh, it's not as easy. You're not seeing people in the hall. You're not uh, asking, people are not thinking of the question that they wouldn't have thought of if they didn't see you in the hall. But so it takes much more affirmative effort but you have to be at the virtual table. So you have to be at the meetings um, on vir in virtual calls. You have to paddle around on the phone. You have to paddle around in virtual meetings and um, you just do the same thing. It's harder work and it is, uh, you really do have to take the lead in making sure those communications continue. So we're at our time limit. No, th thanks so much, uh, Helen and as well as um, Mike for for you know sharing this practical advice, 
And uh, for an, anybody who's attending, want to explore how we can help, uh, you know, build, develop, or optimize your team, feel free to contact any of us. Um, and we will have uh, a one-minute survey we'll be sending out. So uh, appreciate your input. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today. Look thank forward you to participate in thank another you. time. Thank you, everyone, for dialing in. Appreciate it. Thank Great. You. Thanks again. Have a good day.